2019 Bionanogenomics Genome Finishing Webinar Series. All the webinars in the series are pre-recorded. After the presentation in each webinar, we will pose a few questions to the speaker. My name is Ben Clifford, Senior Field Application Scientist at Bionanogenomics. I'll be your host for today's webinar. Today we'll hear the story from a true Renaissance man in science, Dr. Eric Jarvis. Dr. Jarvis is a professor at the Rockefeller University in New York City and chair of the Vertebrate Genomes Project. He is also a research investigator of the prestigious Howard Hughes Medical Institute, an ethologist, and a leading neurobiologist at the nexus of human language evolution and songbird genetics. His work with the Vertebrate Genomes Project is our focus in today's webinar. This project aims to generate near error-free reference genome assemblies of around 70,000 extant vertebrate species. Under his chairmanship, the Vertebrate Genomes Project and collaborators have generated genome assemblies for 117 species to date, representing 90 taxonomic orders, which are either finished or in the final stages of assembly. These genomes will be used to address fundamental questions in biology and disease, to identify species most genetically at risk for extinction, and to preserve genetic information of life. His presentation today is Optical Mapping and Lessons Learned from the Vertebrate Genomes Project. Dr. Jarvis, thank you so much for joining us today. The stage is all yours. Welcome, and uh, thank you for inviting me to talk about the work we are doing and our uh, use of uh, optical maps uh, to um, genomes. So, I'm going to talk about some lessons we've learned uh, in a large scale international project called the Vertebrate Genomes Project uh, and learned many lessons about uh, genomics, including uh, how optical maps can help us and where we can make improvements. I'll begin. Uh, well, I have broke my presentation down in three parts motivation, the history behind it, the development of what uh, I'm going to call platinum quality genomes and some lessons learned. Uh, but uh, my beginning of the history of this really is a study on focused on birds. Uh, my main area of research is understanding brain mechanisms and genetics of vocal learning. And there are roughly 40 or something bird orders. I was involved in generating a draft quality, a short read assemblies of all these bird species you see in this picture here, including those highlighted in red dots, the vocal learners. Uh, these are species like songbirds up here, the Darwin's finch, the crow, it's here, and hummingbirds have the ability to imitate novel sounds like we do for human speech. And they have close relatives highlighted in the white dots here they don't have those abilities. They're like the chimpanzees of the uh, songbird world. And so I wanted to uh, compare their genes uh, each other to find genes that are uh, controlling the evolution and the mechanisms of producing sounds, including speech. But we also wanted to understand their phylogeny. We took all the genomes of these species and compared them to each other and also developed the bird family tree. And with these draft genomes, we ended up publishing over 50 papers in a two year period back in 2014 and 2016, uh, focused on many different questions, including generating a bird family tree, looking at a bunch of neuroscience related traits, including genes involved in vocal learning. And we found genes that were convergent with humans uh, for speech production in these vocal learning birds. Uh, and there were many other questions we could address with these genomes. And when my lab and some others, after making these initial discovery with all these papers here, began to study individual genes, we started to see problems. Uh, problems now we are realizing were big limitations with first and second generation sequencing. It was causing my students to spend many months, sometimes a year or more, cloning the correct gene structures that we could not get with these draft uh, genomes from these birds and other species. Um, and here, even a Sanger-based assembly of the zebra finch, uh, we were seeing uh, gaps in uh, some of these genes. One of my favorites, SLIT1, a mutate in humans causes uh, autistic speech deficits, a speech sound disorder deficits, and we found it related in the brain differently in songbirds and humans. When we want to study the gene and do function manipulations, we found junctions between the contigs here with this red circle were, were missing. Um, so we, a lot, preventing us from assembling the gene completely. So, or we had entire genes that were missing or incorrectly assembled genes or, and what was happening was biologically meaningful 
imaginative regions were also not assembled correctly, were actually surprisingly different in vocal learning species compared to non-vocal learning species. So we couldn't study them properly. And like I said, this caused many months to clone individual genes to get the correct gene structure and to sequence them over again. And many people were unknowingly working with artifactual gene structure and sequence and unknowingly making false conclusions about the biology. Uh, we wanted to do something about this. With the success of that bird project, the uh, G10K leadership asked me to uh, help lead the G10K organization whose mission it was to generate high quality genomes of 10,000 vertebrate species and uh, utilize those genomes to ask some questions on biology. So, uh, <clears throat> but I didn't wanna repeat the same problems that we had in our prior projects. So in leading the, uh, this G10K organization, I uh, tried to work with different companies like Bayan Nano and others developed a technology for generating platinum quality genomes. And this is the second part of my talk here, uh, where we kind of started. We took two of these vocal learning species, a hummingbird and a songbird. Uh, this is the honest hummingbird, the zebra finch. And uh, starting about four years ago, we uh, basically had, especially the hummingbird, but both of these guys went by multiple technologies, Illuminage, Sanger, PacBio, nanopore from short reads to long reads, and multiple scaffolding approaches like 10x genomics, including bio nanogenomics, uh, two different methods, two enzyme approach versus the single DLS or DLA1 approach. Uh, Dovetail had their Chicago uh, uh, linked uh, uh, short read to approach in. And we had high c which goes from long range chromosomal arm uh, links uh, from one end to the other end. And so, <clears throat> Uh, all of the companies, including BioNano, were promising that their technology, and some were even promising that their technology alone would achieve what we wanted to do, which is to get higher quality genomes, prevent our students, or, or, or don't have to mean our students to go and clone those genes. And to make a long story short, a few of the lessons are shown in this slide. The first lesson we learned is that uh, there's a big difference between long reads and short reads. So here on the x-axis, the N50 contig leg, we mount the genome in the sequence where 50% of the scaffolds, or contigs in this case, have half the genome. And we find that uh, looking at all these different assembly combinations, any combination of technology we use, even in combination of short reads with BioNano, N50 contigs that were below 100,000 base pairs long. Whereas whenever we use long reads, by itself, like PacBio or combined with BioNano, uh, we got uh, contigs that were much better than um, with short reads alone. And it's only when we filled in the gaps where we were able to get even further than that. Uh, looking at the scaffolds, scaffolds allowed gaps uh, in them. Uh, the short read and long reads didn't make too much of a difference, but combining long range scaffolding information like with BioNano or HiC did make a difference and made these scaffolds to go chromosomal length, as shown here. And using the, zebra, the, in the, uh, sorry, the hummingbird karyotype here, we were able to match these chromosomes in the karyotype with uh, complete scaffolds here in the hummingbird that matched the number of chromosomes we would expect from looking at these karyotype maps. So um, <clears throat> found improvements um, with uh, annotations. Uh, here is uh, RNA-seq data mapped back to the genome of a zebra finch uh, using short read or intermediate read uh, technologies. What it means is that we get complete mapping to one part of the genome. Uh, black is ambiguous mapping, uh, and green is, you know, no assigned specific features. It's not clear if that part of the genome is assembled well or not. And here, with the new improved genomes, more contiguous, now, most of our RNA-seq data here in blue is mapping back to the genome, uh, which means that we're utilizing more of the genomic information, uh, to, in this case, to look at gene expression uh, in the brain determined from the transcriptome. What about the genes that we were most interested in, like SLIP1, an axon guidance gene that I said was, uh, when mutated, causes speech deficits? found that um, with the long reads, we were able to get a contiguous uh, uh, 
assembled molecules with no gaps in them, actually corrected some of these gaps here and corrected the exon structure where the previous exon structure was incorrect and we had the wrong protein coding sequence uh, here at the beginning and here at the end of the gene. So this even corrected some gene structure of some famous genes. Another uh, issue we found is that if you don't separate out the haplotypes, you get errors. Here is a repeat region, a repeat one, repeat two, uh, was in front of uh, this gene called DUSP1, which when birds sing, it's upregulated in these song learning nuclei. This white signal here is the mRNA product. Uh, but when they move around, we don't see it upregulated in the brain area. So this gene is specialized in its vocalizing driven gene regulation in the brain of these birds that we don't see in uh, other species or in non-vocal areas. There must be a regulatory difference in, in front of the uh, uh, transcript of this gene. And certain enough, we found these repetitive sequences in front of the coding sequence. But we found with our short reads assemblies that, or even just regular assemblies, they were assembling this repetitive sequence, which we think is responsible for this specialized regulation of two different haplotypes together. Instead, what we found is that if you separate out the haplotypes, what's really going on is that each haplotype is so divergent from each other, really be on the paternal and maternal chromosomes and not one strung together incorrectly like this. Red is one haplotype here and the green is the other. Okay, so this taught us some lessons uh, to, uh, moving towards what we call platinum quality genomes using BioNano technologies combined together. What I'm going to talk about now in the rest of my presentation here, going forward from that point onward, the lessons we've learned and particularly how it relates to using BioNano optical maps uh, in the context of this vertebrate genomes project. So once we realize we now can generate assemblies that are generating a quality data that prevents us from having to go back and clone genes over and over again. We to take on an ambitious project we call the Vertebrate Genomes Project, whose goal it is to sequence all vertebrate species on the planet. At the time we calculated there were 66,000 species, uh, but um, we realized there are actually more I've broken up into different uh, categories here. Uh, families of, uh, of um, <clears throat> sorry, let me backtrack here. Uh, what we would consider our first phase of this project would be doing 260 orders of vertebrates, uh, where one species per order would represent those 260. These two would be doing all families of species, will re represent the Earth Biogenome Project milestone for doing all families of life on the planet at high quality. And if phase three would be all genera, roughly 10,000 species, which reach our G10K milestone, and eventually all 66,000, completing all bats, all birds for B10K and so forth. Uh, but when we did our real calculations, we discovered more species than uh, 66,000, so 71,000. So it became more expensive. Uh, <clears throat> so here, written is the goal of our project, is to generate at least one high quality, error-free, near gapless chromosomal level haplotype phase and annotated reference genome assembly for all extent vertebrate species utilize those genomes to address fundamental questions in biology disease and conservation uh, because as many people know we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction many species are about to go extinct are going extinct and we can't wait to get high quality data at some point in the future we need to do it now uh, at least help those species, if not, at least save their genetic data for all time. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, how do we define orders? What we realize in generating a genome scale tree of birds or of mammals is that uh, what most classification biologists call orders were species that diverge from a common ancestor sometime around the, since the last mass extinction of, of dinosaurs back 66 million years ago. So, uh, using that criterion for mammals and for birds, we go for, and for all vertebrates, that is fish, frogs, reptiles, and so on, uh, instead of 150 orders, we came up with the number of 260. 58 mammals, 52 birds, 33 reptiles, 29 amphibians, 89 fish. And we decided to select 260 species and apply a particular assembly pipeline uh, to reach a certain metric. 
uh, and that metric uh, that we felt was going to allow us to generate all these scientific discoveries is to have an N50 contig value, an N50 uh, scaffold and chromosomal base accuracy that is represented in this number here, where three means an M50 contig value of 1 million base pairs or greater in our assembly. Four is an N50 scaffold value of 10 million base pairs or more in our assembly. It means um, have 90% of the genome with two pieces of evidence assembled into chromosomes, right? And then a base call accuracy of 40 or better, which means no more than one error out of 10,000 base pairs, per 10,000 base pairs in your assembly, the ha genome haplotype phase as much as possible between the maternal and the paternal chromosomes. Uh, so this was a tall order, and we weren't quite there yet, but we worked with the various sequencing companies to try to achieve this goal, including with BioNano. And here is a pipeline for our phase one that we have come up with that is getting us there for many uh, of these species. It's not using one technology, but using a combination of technologies where we start off with the packed bio long reads here in these dashed black lines. We assemble them into contigs, uh, and then we uh, get rid of duplications, which I'll talk about in a minute, about haplotype duplications in blue here. Take those contigs, uh, and we then scaffold them with, bio, not by now, in the first case here, 10 X genomics linked reads, and then we take those scaffolded HackBio 10X uh, data and scaffolded further with BioNano optical maps, uh, which is longer range information, and then go further with Hi-C, which is even further. Uh, and so here in this blue um, uh, outline box is a contig that's shown what happens as it goes through this pipeline as we go longer and longer range information. Towards the end of this pipeline, then we fill in gaps with the pack bio long reads that are present in the assembly using a gap filling and polishing algorithm that takes also short reads and corrects errors that we see in the long read data. Uh, and then we send it to uh, the G valve curation team at Sanger Institute. All the data together, the pack bio, the 10X, the bio nano, the high C, and try to find where are the errors in the genome and use these various data types to correct those errors to generate a more complete assembly. Here is an example of what the curation team is looking at. This is what we call a high C map of the high C data mapped back to the final assembly, which includes the bio nano data. What we're looking for is boxes like this, where you have a diagonal of reads from the high C data maps back to the scaffold here, with no other boxes showing in uh, a red uh, marking to that diagonal, no other reads from other scaffolds. This means this is a complete assembled chromosome that uh, was generated from the PacBio, 10X, BioNano, and HiC data. But we have other cases here where they look like two chromosomes that are fused together, or other cases here where there's a, a not a complete chromosome because there's another scaffold that belongs to that chromosome, not yet been linked. You can use the, this data align with the bio nano and other data to actually then fix those chromosomes and now manually get a complete chromosome map from 33 chromosomes here in the case of the zebra finch. And we uh, tested this pipeline approach on 16 species uh, last year. And over this past year, we did an analysis on these, three species of birds with four different types of genomes, one reptile, one amphibian, and five species of fish. And so to, what I'm going to finish off here is show you what we've learned uh, and to help you out as well with the genomes that you're working on. Here is the average molecule length distance. And what we've done is we use the uh, BioNano agarose plug method, circular moments BioNano combination method, to isolate high molecular weight DNA. And then we take that high molecular weight DNA and apply it to all these different technologies. Sometimes we actually have to shear those molecules down to work with pack bio. And what we see is the pack bio data gets us in the 10,000 or so uh, and more read length range. The 10X gets us out to about 100,000 molecule length. And then on two enzyme approach gets us to the 1 million base pair range uh, uh, for scaffolding or, or molecule range. And then the bio nano DLS approach gets us to the chromosomal level, 
when combined with high C gets us arm to arm. And what we found, um, what's interesting is that for the Sanger, Eber Finch chromosome mapping that we had before, they annotated chromosome one and one B relative to chicken. And they argued using fish mapping, I say they, I was part of that original paper back in 2010. He argued that um, two separate chromosomes in the zebra finch, and that's why we called it 1A in this case and 1B. That the high C and the bio nano mapping spanned these two chromosomes, two scaffolds, and really brought them together as one chromosome, realizing this was an error in the prior fish mapping and Sanger based approach. And so now we have actually fewer chromosomes in the zebra finch, uh, large chromosomes, and actually more small chromosomes that we discovered uh, using this approach. We were able to go from using the older Illumina or Sanger based sequences, we had from 33 to 7,000 gaps per chromosome. Uh, using this more uh, iterative assembly approach, we're now down to either one to 25 gaps uh, per chromosome. And another bird species, the kakapo, we have zero gaps in some of the chromosomes. Uh, and when we look at where those gaps are at, what's going on with them, eval viewing uh, tool. Uh, and it was very useful to have the bio nano data here to validate with some other data types what's going on here in this one gap in chromosome 12. And what we found is that high coverage pack bio reads were piling up gap sequence. It was in a very high C GC rich region here shown by this gray bar. And uh, here there's this gap in this little tiny red dot here uh, where there's zero pack bio coverage and it's an exact boundary where the bio nano optical maps stop. So they're stopping at this region of high pack bio coverage, which, net, which we have since looked at has a centromere signal. In this case, the DLS, I mean, the uh, two enzyme approach did not get across that centromere. Other cases that we're examining and now where the DLS approach of bio nano, that's you, you know, the non nicking approach with one enzyme is getting across some of the centromeres. Uh, <clears throat> So, but uh, the, the bio nano data was able to get through all the other parts of the chromosomes without any gaps uh, in them. So, um, <clears throat> comparing the different data types in the entire assembly pipeline that I just told you about. Well, we looked at end to end joins, the initial assembly input, uh, what the 10X and the bio nano are joining together in the pack bio contags. What one method is correcting over the other. Uh, and when one method corrects over the other, what do you join together and what you break? And here are a bunch of numbers. I, I know you're not going to pay attention to all these numbers. The main message I want to say here, as we go through the assembly pipeline, pack bio combined with 10x, followed by th those two combined with bio nano, followed by those three combined with high C, followed by what the manual curation team does, uh, the following story shapes up looking at these uh, 15 or so, or a subset of those assemblies. That in blue here is all the uh, number of contigs that the 10X genomics technology combined together, 86 pack bio contigs, uh, 217 pack bio contigs, and so on. Uh, in orange here are all the contigs that the 10X data said we should break. So five contigs that uh, pack bio assembly got wrong, basically. And here the bio nano data says, okay, these are the additional uh, now scaffolds that bio nano brought together that the 10X was not able to bring together. Uh, further, these are the bio nano scaffolds that uh, broke uh, that said either pack bio or 10X got wrong. Uh, and you'll see in a case example here, how one method actually uh, uh, checks out the other, where we had 13 contigs that 10X broke that BioNano recorrected. Um, and then further on with high C scaffolding, you see a similar scenario here. And in purple are, are, are where we find further conflicts where the technology breaks the contig or a scaffold and leaves it broken. Basically, the manual curation team here did more, and the end result here is that our, there's a lot of consistency between the 10X, the bio nano, and the high C scaffolding. 
90 something percent of, of those technologies are consistent with each other in the scaffolding of the pack bio data. But where they are wrong, I think the, the bio nano customers would be happy to know is that the bio nano is more, af more often accurate in these purple labeled uh, um, drawings here than the, uh, the 10X and the high C data. And because of that, uh, uh, we are using BioNano as a validation tool for 10X and high C for the scaffolding. Uh, uh, so, uh, but we're not out of the woods. There are other things that are going on, creating problems that we have to fix. One of them is heterozygosity. You see a plot here of these initial assemblies of these different species. And in black is the uh, primary contig length. Uh, and uh, from the, uh, the assembled genome size based upon the primary contigs. And in uh, blue is the other haplotype that we had to phase out. What we've learned is we have to phase out the other haplotype as early as possible. And what we find is that some of these genomes are overassembled. It's higher than the expected genome size uh, by this blue line here, like in this thorny skate genome this female zebra finch here. And we find that the higher the heterozygosity in this, perp, this gray line here, the more probability we'll find uh, uh, the assembly longer than what it should be. And people will get excited. This is a big giant assembly, but it's actually wrong. Finding out what's responsible, it's the other haplotype of some segments of this genome are so divergent from each other that the assemblers are treating them as two separate genes instead of two, the homologous gene and stringing it together with a gap as the artificial gene duplication. Uh, and particularly for the skate in the, in the zebra finch, this was the case. So we find 20 to, two to 20% of the genome are, has false duplications. 99% uh, of them contain a gap between it. And uh, one third of all gaps in the assemblies result of these artificial gene duplications. Another problem we're seeing is that not just uh, uh, the haplotypes duplications of mother and father chromosomes, but repeats even within one haplotype. And we're finding that in blue here, the greater number of repetitive elements in the genome going from 10 or 20% to 50% of the genome in this fish here being duplicated the harder it is to assemble to higher level of contiguity in the N50 contig values here. And we find some crazy genomes, like the platypus has 10 sex chromosomes. Can you believe that? Five X's and five Y's. Uh, some lamprey genomes have uh, large scale gene, uh, duplications to them, or deletions, I should say, sorry, uh, making the assembly more difficult. So we're starting to evaluate this and using the BioNano data to help us out. One uh, lesson we learned here about these artificial duplications shown here in this G valve evaluation. So in um, blue here is our scaffold. In, in gray here are the pack bio contigs. In uh, purple here are the bio nano optical maps. In this case, the hummingbird with uh, the two enzyme approach. In um, orange is where the bio nano map is consistent with the pack bio data and the rest of the assembly. And in, in uh, here in red is where there's a conflict. And what we're finding out is that these conflicts are at these junctions here where there's an artificial haplotype duplication. This, this uh, you can see in this bio nano map here, this, this uh, um, you know, in silico digest is repeat right here. And you can see the RNA-seq data in uh, green here is a repeat. Pack biocontig should really be overlapping this. And when we overlap this pack biocontig with the other one here, uh, this conflict with the bio nano map goes away. Whereas the bio nano data was correct, and the pack bio falcon and zip assembler incorrectly as assembled these two contigs as a haplotype duplication. Uh, <clears throat> here, what about another one? Uh, this was an interesting one. Here in the high C uh, map, this is now blown up of a chromosome. Uh, we see that there's an inversion signal here in the high C data. At the bio nano data, there's, there isn't any error there. There isn't a lot of red going on here. It indicates some kind of conflict with the sequence data. What we found out here is that this is a real biological inversion. 
and that um, the PAC bio reads go across that inversion, because one haplotype has uh, the inversion relative to the other. If we looked at the bio nano data of one haplotype relative to the other, we saw the bio nano data was inverted naturally. Uh, and we're seeing that in the bio nano and the high C plots as well. Um, here is a case where um, <coughs> C data uh, mapped one scaffold 55 to scaffold 31 as N to N here. But we found that the bio nano data was saying, no, 55 should join at the beginning of scaffold uh, 31, but the, at the end of scaffold 31. That is shown here. Here is the reference uh, a chromosome basic uh, map that has all the data and below are the bio nano maps. We find for, uh, let's call it chromosome 31, if you, for the sake of clarity, uh, simplicity, and chromosome 55. And we're finding that uh, those two really should belong together, or scaffold, I'm sorry, I shouldn't do that. Scaffold 31, scaffold 55. This bio nano map links the two of them together. We find uh, the high C data couldn't make a, a decision as to should 55 go on this end of the chromosome or on that end of the chromosome, uh, where the bio nano data clearly said it should go on this other end here. And so in the manual creation, they moved it from here to here. <clears throat> so how we're gonna do this going forward to correct these problems of haplotypes uh, correctly, to it, without having the manual curation team have to depend upon looking at comparing bio nano to high C to pack bio and so forth. Uh, one method uh, coming out of Adam Philippi's group uh, with the wrong Ray and Sergey Corin is to use the trio approach. Take a uh, uh, long read data, short read data of the parents of let's say the father here and the mother here, and then use it to sort out the long read data the child, in this case, a female zebra finch, and then assemble the two haplotypes separately. And they have done this for the uh, PAC bio data and getting more beautiful assemblies where we're reducing these haplotype duplication problems uh, 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 quite a bit. Um, they're still, we're using the bio nano uh, data and the high C data and the 10X data uh, from both parent or both haplotypes equally instead of sort separating them out. In this case, it was only the long read uh, separation. But to show you what that does is that here is an assembly, female zebra finch child, uh, before um, uh, this trio approach and after. So before the trio approach, we have an N50 contig value of 3 million base pairs and uh, gene duplication Busco scores of 5% on, on, the, um, on, on, on the assembly itself. Whereas after separating out using this trio uh, uh, binning approach, uh, we get an assembly that's actually a little bit bigger, uh, but only uh, now 1.4% duplication of these Busco genes. So it basically said th three point something percent of the uh, genome was being duplicated as a result of not separating out the haplotypes. With Alex Hastings' group, uh, the VGP is now collaborating uh, the BioNano to try to do the same thing we've done on the actual sequence reads, but now on the BioNano mo uh, molecules themselves. In this case, showing for a human genome, where we created um, BioNano optical maps for a child, in this case, a male child, and uh, that human child's parents, and then use <clears throat> PAC bio data also created on the child and the parents and align the bio nano molecules of, of the mother and the father with each other. We're able to use the father bio nano molecules to separate out um, the bio nano uh, data of the father that was in the child. Out here is in the big circle. We're able to use the mother bio nano molecules to separate out the mother's contribution to the ch child's genome. And basically, we we're able to get most of the, uh, the genome separated out uh, into the maternal and paternal uh, haplotypes uh, uh, from the child by nanomolecules. Uh, about 11 gigabases of the uh, data was not separable. And what Alex did here is basically just split it down the middle and gave the father half and the mother half uh, just to try to get even coverage. Um, and so 
showing here of uh, the result of that, uh, we can see that uh, here in the child assembly, now this is the binano assembly, right? That there are differences between the haplotype where there is a large insertion here in the uh, paternal compared to the maternal that what that wouldn't assemble uh, properly if we had not separated them out. And here you can show paternally uh, separated out uh, assemblies with the maternally separated out assemblies in this large insertion here, uh, uh, you know, found in one haplotype but not the other. And here is now the the hybrid assembly, where uh, uh, here is the father pack bio data combined with the father bio nano data, but in the child genome. Pack bio and the bio nano data in the child genome, and uh, here is the initial bio nano map assembly. We're getting a high end fifty of fifty uh, one million base pairs and forty three in the in the father and the mother uh, haplotypes respectively. Uh, here is the sequence uh, n fifty in the pack bio data twelve million base pairs, so pretty high already. Also in the mother and the father haplotypes, and then in the hybrid. Uh, the, the Conte N50 is not changing much, of course, because we're not filling in gaps yet. N50 scaffold is, is going almost to the theoretical minimum, uh, uh, um, above, you know, theoretical maximum, that is. Here, in this case, 79 million base pairs for the uh, uh, paternal haplotype and 69 million for the uh, uh, maternal. We have not yet actually uh, linked this with the 10X and the uh, IC data. Uh, we're going to do so. But we're practically at chromosomes already here by getting rid of these artificial genes. And so I'm going to end here and I'm going to go ahead and take questions. But before I do, I'm going to give credit to the VGP assembly group. All of this is not my uh, work. Um, it's some of what we do here at Rockefeller, but it's a team of people from around the world, and particularly in this uh, VGP assembly working group, Adam Philippi's group at the Sanger Institute, my group. Oliver um, Olivier Federigo here at Rockefeller, Richard Durbin, Shane McCarthy, and others at the uh, University of Cambridge and the Sanger Institute, Gene Myers at Max Planck, and uh, Kirsten Howe, William Chow at the Sanger Institute, Harris Lewin, Juan Adamas at UC Davis, uh, Goji Zhang, and others at BGI, and uh, all the companies we uh, collaborated with, including PacBio, 10X Genomics, uh, Aroma Genomics, BioNano, DNA Nexus, Phase Genomics, and so on. And with that, I'll, I thank you for your time and attention, and uh, uh, we'll take questions. Dr. Jarvis, thank you very much for that presentation. That was excellent. Um, very happy to, to hear your experiences with us. Uh, uh, first question is, uh, curious, what criteria for sequencing data quality you use uh, before integrating the sequence with BioNano data? So to uh, to explain that, sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to go right back to um, the slide that shows our pipeline uh, to show what we do that will help others um, determine what kind of quality they need as well. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we try to use an approach that. Um, had, generates the longest molecule possible to tell us, do we have the right quality of data necessary? And so looking at all these approaches, high c data actually has the longest range information, but the high c protocol actually that we use requires solid tissue. You don't want to, or, or cells, living cells, not isolating DNA. So that one doesn't matter. Therefore, it's the bio nano itself. And so, <clears throat> So what we do is we start out by isolating uh, DNA using the bio nano plug method or the circulomics approach, which you collaborated uh, with on. If we do not get two to 300 KB molecules using this bio nano approach, we don't even proceed with the other technologies. So that has to work first. Then once we have that quality, then we know we can do PAC bio 10 X and the high C and everything else. So my next question is a two-parter. Um, so you showed uh, several examples where BioNano maps uh, were able to error correct uh, misconstructions uh, from high C and otherwise. Um, and the two-parter is when you identify those conflicts, are you doing so with the hybrid scaffold pipeline in our software? 
And then the second part is, uh, in principle, do you think at scale uh, resolving these conflicts can be automated completely, uh, or do you always foresee a role for manually resolving? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> like this conflict here, right, where the bio nano data was correct and the, um, uh, the conflict was actually in improper haplotype phasing, That's an initial uh, contact, contacting. So what we've done is that we, we're, we're, it, this is an iterative process. What you're looking at here on your screen is the, what the manual curators are looking at in the G evaluation uh, uh, process. So G valve stands for genome evaluation. G genome evaluation team is recognizing all of these errors. They're, they're, they're writing them down, they're quantifying them, and they're feeding this information back to the assemblers. The assembly uh, experts are then using that information to improve the assembly pipeline so that we can reduce these kinds of errors here. And uh, uh, is one, one answer to your question. And the other answer is when we actually do manually correct, um, it, we do use uh, the bio nano data as a, I won't say a ground truth, but uh, we find that it's more often accurate than some of the others. So we trust that more, but we can't trust just one technology only. So we have to say when bio nano plus high C, or bio nano plus 10X, um, if we find a conflict be, with bio nano com compared to uh, high C and 10X, we do find those sometimes. So then we go back and tell Alex Hasty and others at bio nano, this is an error in the bio nano data, find some way to make automatic corrections to that in the future. So we can give feedback so that we actually then Prove all the technologies to get hopefully one day perfect assemblies in an automatic way. <laughs> Great. Uh, that, that's a wonderful perspective, and that leads into the next question. Um, do you have any suggestions to us at BioNano uh, here now about improving our assemblies for your goals? So, for the large genomes, uh, maybe especially the highly heterozygous or repetitive ones. And so, um, <clears throat> Uh, fortunately, uh, the feedback that I've given uh, to BioNano, they, they are following through uh, with this um, approach that we're working with Alex Hasty on to uh, do basically trio binning, as we call it, separating out the haplotypes in the um, uh, uh, pater uh, paternal and maternal chromosomes. But for the future, what I think I'm going to say to BioNano and everybody is that uh, Haplotype separation, this heterozygosity issue, is probably 80% of the remaining problem of getting high quality genome assemblies. Longer and longer molecules is the remaining part. So even if you have to go, you know, one third of a chromosome or half of a chromosome, if you if you have a dip genome and you're not separating out those haplotypes, you're going to make mistakes. And, and when you get to a tetraploid genome, you're going to make mistakes. So I encourage BioNano to really focus more and more on uh, developing tools, developing approaches, not to only scale up to do many, many genomes, but to do many, many genomes well by uh, dealing with this heterozygosity problem. Great. And then the, the final question, uh, the Vertebrate Genome Lab at Rockefeller uh, recently upgraded to one of our Generation 2 sapphires. Uh, so this is with the dual cartridge module, uh, which means that two chips can be loaded in, uh, three flow cells apiece. You can uh, put six samples uh, loaded into the sapphire at once, which means that you'll be able to collect a lot faster. Uh, and then just in the interest of scaling, uh, what are your plans to scale the BioNano work as the overall project scales? Uh, and how does that plan integrate with the rest of your project? That's a good question. And, uh, and once again, it's Olivier Federigo here who's uh, leading the charge in that in our vertebrate genomes lab here at Rockefeller and uh, getting that instrument installed now. And uh, yes, so uh, we, we we kind of debated, but for a short period, uh, should we get uh, this new instrument, this upgraded Sapphire, because we're depending on the other technologies to scale up evenly. That's, that hasn't been the case. Uh, in this case, BioNano scaled up 
faster than some of the other uh, technologies that we're combining together. But we, we, we realize that if we can do six genomes per day or per week or, you know, instead of six per month or something like this, then uh, <clears throat> So we might not be able to move some of the other ones faster. We'll have our bio nanodata quicker, which then allows us to spend time on scaling up the other technologies in which we're combining bio nano with. That's one thing. The other is that we're just going to have to scale up. Uh, so for this phase one of the vertebrate genomes project, the 117 or so genomes, I think you might have mentioned earlier, uh, that we've generated over the last uh, two years, really a hundred of those in the last year, uh, were, were done with the prior Sapphire approach and even before that, the, you know, the, um, what, what was it called? It was called the... Uh, the iris? There you go. Yeah. We had started with the iris. That's right. That seems like ancient days already. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, we, we, uh, uh, we, we have, that was already a scaling up, but we realize that once we scale up one approach, it makes it easier for us to then start doing genomes faster and faster. This year, we're going to have to do not only 100 more genomes, we need to finish 160 genomes for phase one of the VGP. Uh, we also got a grant funded uh, from the NIH Institute to do a new human reference genome over again, approach similar to the VGP pipeline uh, with uh, trios. Uh, using a, a combination of that and uh, using BioNano uh, with 200, uh, uh, 350, sorry, human individuals representing human diversity around the world. Pan human genome reference where we're going to use BioNano, if not all of those persons. And to do all of that rapidly and quickly, we need to scale up. Uh, and so uh, eventually, to do all 71,000 vertebrate species and many humans, but let's just say all 71,000 vertebrate species, 10 years, we need to do 125 genomes per week. And uh, so BioNano needs to scale up even further for us to do that. Certainly, that's, well, that's incredible. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jarvis. I wish we had more time here to discuss discuss the topic. Uh, again, it was really great to have you here uh, talking through the genome finishing work that you've been able to do with the Sapphire system. You're welcome. Uh, and thank you everyone for tuning into the webinar. Uh, please email any questions to support at bionanogenomics.com and reference this webinar. Also, please check out our website, www.bionanogenomics.com for more information and resources. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.